Hey guys, welcome to IDS Tactical. We're here at Silencer Co. in Salt Lake City with Gary Hughes and Mike Pappas. And they're here to tell us about Silencer Co.'s product lineup, and we'll get right into it. So uh, guys, can you kind of give me a brief history of the company and kind of how you guys got started in the industry? Well, we started, we thought that there could be some improvements made, and we had a couple different things that we wanted to build and some ideas, so we thought we'd give it a shot. Here yeah. we are. Awesome. So, uh, how long ago did you guys start Silencer Co? Mm, two and a half. Yeah, two almost, and a half, three years ago. Yeah, almost three almost years ago. Three years. Yeah. How'd you guys come up with the uh, the idea for the company? Well, Josh and John mostly are. They kind. They did the start. The bulk of it, and talked to me about it a little early on to see if it would be feasible and I don't know. Yeah. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> the company started because they felt like there was room for improvement Absolutely. on existing products that were on the market. Um, the industry as a whole hasn't seen any great technological leaks, leaps for a very, very long time. And so John and Josh and Mike got together and had an idea basically for a new 22 silencer is how, how the company started. Um, the biggest problem that we saw in the industry with 22 long rifle suppression was ease of maintenance. Um, the suppressors are so dirty and they foul so badly and you get so much letting in them for a high volume user that you had a very definite service life Absolutely. on the unit. Um, and Mike came up with an idea that we felt like would pretty much revolutionize the way that 22 long rifle suppressors were cleaned and maintained. And that was the idea of the half pipes on the Sparrow product. Right. And the way that it works is the 22 Sparrow, most of your fouling that happens in inside of a 22 long rifle suppressor happens on the inside of the main tube. Now, on a sealed suppressor, it just builds up and builds up and builds up, and gradually the suppressor gets heavier and gets louder and louder and louder as you decrease that internal volume. Now, traditionally, at that point, you've had to send that suppressor back to the manufacturer. They've had to cut it open, clean it. You pay for that service, mm -hmm. and they send it back to you to get it back up to peak operating performance. Or, with other designs on the market that you can take apart, but you have to follow a very rigid maintenance schedule. Otherwise, the threads get fouled or the fouling builds up too much on the inside of the tube to be able to pull or push the baffle stack through the fouling that exists on the inside of the main tube. With the silencer code design, basically the main tube of the silencer is just a sleeve that contains the half pipes. So that piece does not get fouling in it because it's O-ring sealed away from the gases and the carbon fouling. Plus, it has no threads in it either. Right. It's just to hold those half pipes on, so the likelihood of it having some kind of a problem is very low. And that's your serialized part, too. Right? And that's right. the serialized part. So basically, every other part but this is replaceable on that suppressor by us in a warranty-type situation. So the half pipes, which are still around the core here, Instead of trying to push, pull, or beat the baffle stack yeah. through all that fouling on these half pipes, we simply pull the fouling away from the baffle stack. And most of the fouling is going to be contained on the inside of those half pipes. And that is a dirty suppressor. That's the same suppressor yeah. we just shot on the range. Absolutely. Um, so this really sort of revolutionized the 22 long rifle silencer market. And that, that product is why silencer coexists today is these guys have this idea of a better way to clean and maintain 22 long rifle sound suppressors. And this is the latest incarnation of it. Um, this is a stainless steel model that we make. The first model had this same half pipe system, but is a slightly different design. And this is the newer model. But in a this nutshell, a different baffle stack as well. It's a different right. baffle stack, different material. Um, it's a completely redesigned package. But at the core of it, what makes it easy to clean and maintain are these half pipes right. and that replaceable, all the replaceable parts. So also, if you shoot copper-plated ammo, 
people get the feeling that that's jacketed and it isn't and it will shed lead not as bad as if it were just straight lead but still 22 it's yeah. tough and we have shot these suppressors so much with in between cleaning sessions that we've completely filled the first couple of expansion chambers in the suppressor <laughs> and they still come apart just like that so regardless of round count yeah that suppressor is fairly easy to clean and maintain four in the old sparrow is the maximum amount that you <laughs> yeah. can do because the rest of it's so filled up it quits to shoot it doesn't shoot straight anymore yeah and it's just loud it gets loud and but it's then heavy we took it apart cleaned it yeah. back down yeah. the road you know so it runs but that is a nutshell is, is why silencer coexists is innovation and coming out with products that lead that product category in the market. And from a cleaning and maintenance perspective, there's nothing else in the industry like this suppressor. And now with the redesign of the stack and everything, there's also very, very few suppressors anywhere in the world that can come close to it in terms of sound reduction. And it's very versatile also in the fact that it's multi-caliber. You can shoot 22 short, long, long rifle, 22 Magnum, 17 HMR, 17 Mach 2, and now on the stainless Sparrow, it's also capable of being used on the 5.7 by 28 FM. Awesome. So, so now how did the uh, half pipe design come about, Mike? <sighs> A few <laughs> days of uh, really thinking about it hard yeah. and just sketching out a bunch of different ideas and means that it could come apart, you know, beveled mm -hmm. and stepped and... and uh, one morning I woke up and there it was. Fell in your toilet like back of the feature. <laughs> one of those one of those <laughs> uh, flux capacitor. <clears throat> one of those cocktail napkin kind of yeah. ideas I don't recall a toilet being involved, but there was a bed involved. Awesome. But <laughs> So that was why the company was born, was to bring innovation to a market that had been stagnant. Um, for, yeah. for quite a long time, and, and we do a pretty good job of that. Nothing we do is like anything that... Well, just like what you makes. guys were saying with the testing protocol, how, you know, you know using that analog needle and... Yeah, we test much. differently, we yeah. build differently, we design differently, we take input from all of our employees. Um, we all have very, very diverse, different backgrounds. You know, we have a lot of musicians working here. John comes from the recording industry. Mike's been a mechanic for a good part of his life. Most of it, yeah. I've been a firearms sales, law enforcement, military sales guys for pretty yeah. much my whole career. So we all bring a different piece of the picture. And when it gets done, hopefully it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. We'll see what happens. So that was, that was how the company got started. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little about the Osprey and kind of how that's changing the game as well. Osprey does a good job of that. Um, even looking at the Osprey, you can tell that it's a different design. Um, I like to tell people, and I think Mike would agree with this, that we are a, when we design, we're a design goal-oriented company. We don't start out with any preconceived notions about what a product should look like or what it should do. We only have an idea of what we want to fix, things that are what we see as problems or areas of improvement mm -hmm. that can happen on any given product category, like center fire handgun suppressors. Yeah. Um, we start out with a list of design goals, and then we figure out how to get there. Um, and Osprey, we wanted to have best-in-class, world-class sound suppression in the 45 ACP in particular, because that's a particularly different or difficult handgun cartridge to suppress. And popular. And popular. <laughs> One or two guys shoot 45s. Yeah. Um, and so with that as a primary design goal, quiet, um, secondary design goal was we wanted to have a really low signature on the pistol. We wanted to be able to use this suppressor on more host pistols without modifying the factory sights so that more guys would be able to use their carry gun, for yeah. example, with a suppressor instead of having to get a dedicated suppressor host that has sights that are this tall that you can no longer put in a holster or carry on a daily right. basis. So that was really two of the primary design goals behind the Osprey and this is what ended up coming out, out of that process. Um, that's an eccentric suppressor. The, the borehole is not the center line of the suppressor right. and obviously it's not round. You were talking earlier about that design 
I mean, dating back to... Um, yeah, some of the very first Maxim sound suppressors yeah. that he invented were also not concentric or eccentric. Mm -hmm. They were round suppressors, but the borehole was in the top of the circle. Um, one of the reasons that he did that is because they were shooting a lot of iron-sided guns back then, and so um, it's not a new thing in suppressors. This is just sort of a modern take Absolutely. on it, an yeah. updated version. It kind of fell out of favor, um, and we sort of resurrected it, if you will, um, because it accomplished something that we wanted to do, which was have a lower signature in the sight picture than a lot of other competitive designs. Um, and basically we moved the baffle stack. You can actually see this cutaway here. Um, this is a really early pre-production prototype, so it's, a, it's slightly different now, but this gives you the basic, mm -hmm. the basic rundown of what it looks like inside and cut in half. Um, when we like to go to shows and stuff and people ask us about this, Mike likes to tell them this one's half off. But I would actually take a third off. Like yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> so I haven't had a take yet, though. No. So a lot of the volume, the extra volume that we gain, and we do have extra volume in this design, a, a similar length round suppressor in a, in, a, in a 45, we have about 30% more internal volume with this shape <laughs> over a competitive round suppressor. Yeah. So we moved most of that volume down below the center line of the bore, so it's not in your set picture. And that, that really helps on a lot of host pistols to lessen the amount of obstruction you have of your sights and more importantly of your target. Absolutely. One side note to note here. The Osprey will not roll off of a table under any circumstances. <laughs> yeah, it, it won't, it won't yeah, roll so off the hood of your truck. that going yeah. for it, too. Yeah, it yeah. Won't roll we don't off advertise that a lot, but, you know, just in certain places, it's yeah. kind of a special thing for you guys. <laughs> One of the, instead of making it round, the flat sides um, more closely mirror the lines of most host pistols, most host firearms. Well, now you're talking about the holsters. What specifically does it fit into that you guys have found? A lot of modular type holsters that are, um, I know that there's some from Eagle, there's mm -hmm. a Condor brand one out there that, that they're sort of wraparound Velcro designs right. with open bottoms. I know one of the makes one. Yeah, too. There's, yeah, there's a few companies that do it, and we've had really good luck holstering the pistol with Osprey attached in a lot of those designs. Mm -hmm. And the flat sides help with that. Um, it makes yeah. it a lot easier to holster the firearm and it also makes it easier to draw it back out. Um, a lot of the mall ninjas when I talk about holstering start talking about well how are you going to draw and present the pistol out of a holster with that long. Operationally everybody knows if you've got a suppressed handgun you're already gun on. Um, yeah. And the main idea behind that was to be able to stow and secure the pistol so that you can tr either transition to a long gun or go hands-on and do another task and secure the handgun. Because if you're just standing there with yeah. a pistol lanyard and a suppressed pistol, say in a SWAT environment, yeah. you're essentially out of, out of play at that point because you can't secure your firearm. So the holsterability is not for drawing, it's for holstering. So. Yeah. Now, uh... Let's get back to cleaning a little bit. You guys mentioned, uh, you know, the 22 being user serviceable. Um, what can you do for the Osprey as far as user serviceable parts? The piston assembly here is easily removable with this tool, which every one of these comes with. We have a, a, a cam lever here, and there's a brake. And so you have to undo the cam lever, move the brake out, and then using the supplied tool, you simply unscrew the piston and booster assembly. Um, that is as far apart, I didn't get it all the way out, there we go. That's as far apart as you ever need to disassemble this part of the system. Um, you can clean this out if you want to. Some guys will take like carburetor cleaner, brake free or something and spray it out and mm -hmm. kind of shake it out. Mike likes to take a little Brillo pad and wipe out the inside of the encapsulator. Area. As long as the piston can move freely in that bore, mm -hmm. so when it's installed on your host, if you pull the recoil boost and let go, it'll mm -hmm. snap back, it's good to go. Yeah, so this part really needs very, very little maintenance. Um, as Mike was just describing, when it starts to get a, a sticky a little bit, that's when you would take this booster assembly out and clean it and maintain it. And it's really consists of a spring retainer, mm -hmm. which just pops off, that's held on by friction. There's an O-ring in there. The spring, 
and the piston. And now that's completely disassembled. Um, and you would clean that just like you would your normal firearm, get the, get the carbon fouling off, put a little bit of lubrication on it, just reassemble it, and then it's, uh, it's ready to go right back in there. Now you can shoot different calibers through 45 Osprey. Yeah, um, the pistons are interchangeable across the board. So through a 45 caliber Osprey core, you can shoot a 9 millimeter, a 40 caliber, or a 45 caliber piston assembly. So it truly makes the 45 Osprey a, a real great multi-caliber host. And we have several other sound test uh, videos and things that we've done of shooting sub-diameter calibers through our 45 caliber core. Um, Any time that you shoot sub-diameter projectiles through a larger exit diameter, you will have decreased sound performance. Um, but we have found that we get very, very good performance yeah. shooting, say, 9 millimeter through our 45, which would be worst case scenario. Um, All you need to do at that point is just get the correct piston. Right, you just buy a 9 millimeter piston. Um, we do several different thread pitches, screw it into your 45 suppressor, shoot it, and we're getting really, really good sound suppression. There's only a couple of dedicated 9 millimeter suppressors on the market that can compete with the performance of shooting 9mm through R45, so it's very effective. Very cool. And then, uh, as far as wet versus dry goes, can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah, what you, you um, have found? both of these suppressors were designed to be dry suppressors. Um, they both can be shot wet. Um, we don't typically shoot the 22s wet very often because what you gain is negligible and it adds a significant amount of cleaning duties to that suppressor um, for, for very little gain yeah. in, in sound reduction. The Osprey, however, you do get a fairly significant gain by shooting it wet. Um, as we discussed earlier, the Osprey is one of really only a, uh, a couple of truly hearing safe dry 45 ACP suppressors, so um, it truly is you know, world class in that regard. Um, it's scary quiet wet. Yeah. Um, it's it's as close to Hollywood quiet as you can get in a 45 ACP sound suppressor when you shoot it wet. Um, I don't know what the sound is that Hollywood uses for gunshots, but it's not suppressed. <laughs> it's not suppressed gunshots. Um, we put about five cc's of your favorite coolant of choice, so to speak. Um, I'm a fan of wire pulling gel. We've used water. We've used oil. We've used lithium grease. Just don't use anything <laughs> flammable, and it'll yeah. be fine. But uh, we put that in there, and you know you'll you'll start to see sound suppression, or just slightly above nine millimeter type, um, you know, sound reduction levels by shooting it wet. It's it's really impressive wet, as well as dry. Yeah. Now again, on the Osprey, the serialized part is. Yeah, that's another thing that's kind of silencer code type inter innovation. Wow. Well, the most likely thing to get hurt is the tube, baffle of course, strike. baffle yeah. strike, or percentage-wise, sure. it's just there's more of it, so it's more likely to get run over or whatever. The back cap is made out of a billet. It's super strong, the strongest part on the suppressor, so we decided to um, serialize that, and it can be disassembled and if anyone has any problem with it at all we'll just put a new whole front end on it mm -hmm. the stack and tube and front cap and the I would say not user disassemblable yeah. it's disassemblable yeah. here Mike, Mike try Mike. this at home <laughs> yeah that's Mike, what I'm saying Mike is the only guy after those leave the factory that takes an Osprey apart <laughs> <laughs> that isn't somebody that's bought one Right? <laughs> I mean, sanctioned by silence are going to do that. Mike's the only one sanctioned to do that. But that is the serialized part. You can see the seam there. Yeah. And that was by design because, as Mike said, that is the toughest part of the suppressor. We've not had one yet. We've not had somebody that's been able to damage that part yet beyond repair. No, no, um, no. And we've had guys accidentally shoot them on rifles. Yeah. Um, you know, and bulge well, the rest 308 of the subsonic, and yeah. then say maybe slip in the wrong ammo, and yeah, yeah. we, it'll we put do a pretty good bulge in it if you shoot full power <laughs> 308 through it. We just shot the 300 Whisper right. on the range, which is a subsonic rifle cartridge, and I in fact shoot my 308 
subsonic with an Osprey as well. Which was awesome for Leo, by the way. Yeah, and which it has really good sound reduction for subsonic rifle cartridges, but you do run that risk of someone accidentally yeah. dropping in what I like to call the blue pill <laughs> and uh, sort of bulging the suppressor out. But And we've had that happen. But this bat cap remained intact. We were able to warranty the no suppressor. Yeah. Mike will bust the welds in there, pop that core, put a new core, new tube, new front cap, out the door. And we awesome. turn, we've turned the warrant, the few warranties that we have had, so Mike's been able to turn within 24 hours of receipt. Very cool. So, and that's because of this design. Mm -hmm. You know, some of our customers that have had mishaps, we'll, we'll and see. And they'll, they'll happen. Mm -hmm. They will happen. They, they may have been SOL and paying a tax stamp from another manufacturer where they don't have to with our suppressor because we put a little extra thought into that particular piece there. Let's touch briefly on that cam design again. Um, I want to go over that a little bit and talk about that and why you guys did incorporate that feature. That's too. actually Mike's idea as well, so yeah. I'll let Mike... Well, the we had struggled with that being able to index it to the host firearm. Mm -hmm. Tough thing to do and there's not a lot of space left inside here and that I mean Gary gives me more uh, what I said was we should put it outside if we don't have enough room <laughs> inside. If you woke up one morning. No, John I my first idea was to put a threaded screw that pushed a similar looking affair mm -hmm. down and locked it and John came up with the cam lever mm -hmm. throw which is beautiful and it's yeah, worked absolutely. great and it's easy and fast that's the but you know that's how an idea goes you know from one to the next until you get it right but that it came for need yeah you, know, you, had, you had to have it it has to be locked on because it wasn't round it had to be easy yeah because it, the suppressor's not round and concentric you, know, you can screw any other manufacturer's sure. round suppressor on the gun and it always looks the same. You still have to index it and change your point of impact shift. But yep. the Osprey, you know, any suppressor has point of impact shift. Ours is negligible, minimal, but, yeah. negligible at combat type distances. But because of this shape, you could screw the suppressor down to shoulder and it could conceivably be, you know, a say 45 degrees. Or if you think we're not, if yeah. you think we don't block the sides a little tight like that. Yeah. So you'd screw this design yeah. down to the shoulder point, and then you throw the indexing lever, and then the suppressor will rotate 360 degrees, and you can line it up and index it perfectly for that host, and then throw the cam lever back down, and then it's timed for that particular host. Now you can remove the suppressor completely from the host firearm and put it back on, and it will return to that same index point. The only time you need to re-index the suppressor is if you change the host firearm, or if you take the booster or piston assembly out mm -hmm. for cleaning and maintenance. And you've seen how difficult it is to index it. You could yeah. do it, you can literally do it in the dark by feel. Mm -hmm. um, you can index that and get it timed up yeah. perfectly for your pistol to get that can out of the sights. Awesome. Pretty well, strong unit. now that we've kind of gone over the products you have to offer, let's kind of talk a little bit about why someone would want a silencer. And first of all, silencer, suppressor, same thing, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Right. yeah, we use, we pretty much use the terms interchangeably. Yeah. Or can. <laughs> yeah. Some guys don't like the term can, but <laughs> old habits die hard, I suppose. So. Well, it's not around like a can anymore. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> now, um, there's any number of reasons why people that have not been exposed to silencers, suppressors, um, would want one. They have a ton of benefits. They they basically take away all the stuff that sucks and isn't fun about shooting. The blast, the noise, and the recoil. You know, all of those things are, if not outright eliminated, greatly reduced to the point where it's pleasurable. Um, the sound reduction primarily, you know, is why a guy will typically buy a, a suppressor. And being able to shoot without hearing protection mm -hmm. is it just changes the game. You don't have here, you know, you don't have muffs pushing in on your shooting glasses and yeah. pinching the sides of your head. And when you're on the range, like a lot of us are, four, six, eight, ten hours a day, it's huge to not have to wear that hearing protection. Yeah. Um, and if you have gel inserts or not, right? <laughs> it, it, over time, it all it all starts to be painful. And 
earplugs in the ears and sometimes you go and you forget your hearing protection or you know, any number of reasons. So from a hearing protection standpoint alone, that in and of itself makes the suppressor worth it. Now, you also get the advantage of having less recoil um, or the perception of less recoil. It, it really does change that recoil impulse and makes it more pleasurable to shoot. So if you're starting out a new shooter, the things that scare them are the noise and the recoil. We've yeah. greatly reduced two of those and diminished it. And so Mike and I do range demos all the time, and we just we put suppressed handguns in, say, a new female shooter's hand, and she just cleans house with it. Yeah. You know, on a dueling tree, they just tear it up. Oh, yeah. And everyone is like, oh, man. But it's because it's not loud and it doesn't beat her. Yeah. You know, um, and, and for male shooters who like loud noises, um, you know, you're going to get faster follow-up shots because it is more controlled and you're going to get those rapid secondary and third shots into a target quicker and more accurately because you do have less muzzle rise. So you're going to get back on the target pretty quick. <coughs> so from Especially on that 300 we shot. Yeah. Yeah. My God. Yeah, so yeah. That, those are huge advantages. The other thing is flash reduction. Mm -hmm. um, it's greatly reduced. Mike and I have been up on the range where we'll shoot unsuppressed in the dark from the side and watch mm -hmm. the flash and then shoot it suppressed, and it is drastically reduced. Um, and from an operational perspective, you know, that mask shooter location, Absolutely. you know, uh, no muzzle flash to shoot at kind of thing, mm -hmm. which isn't as much a consideration on the handgun suppressor granted as it is on the, the center for rifles. But it's still there, nonetheless. And from a law enforcement perspective, you know, they operate a lot of times in a, in a hazmat type environment. A meth lab, you know, you have flammable materials around, and you don't want to put out a foot and a half ball of fire in that environment. And so that's why a lot of the, the clan lab teams, clandestine lab teams, mm -hmm. basically are required to run suppressed weapons to reduce that flash risk. It's still there, don't get yeah. me wrong, but... Anything you can do to help contain it is an advantage, and this will do that for you as well. Plus, they're cool. <laughs> Got yeah. that. They have some cool factor at the range, too. <clears throat> well, do you want to talk about any of the new developments you guys are coming out with? I mean, I know you guys got the new, the new Sparrow design. Yeah, we, Sparrow we just redesigned about three weeks ago, and we just showed you that. That's got some pretty cool features. Stainless steel core now instead of the old core, which was aluminum. It's in shorter. In shorter than the old one. Redesigned baffle stacks between two and four decibels quieter on uh, depending on the host. Um, the ability of that suppressor now to be used on the 5.7 by 28 FN is making it really yeah. huge. We just finished the R&D process on that, and we're in full scale production mode on those. Um, and now we are in the the R&D process on our 5.56 and 7.62 rifle programs. Um, awesome. That program will be. Much like everything else we do, we have a few design goals um, that we want to accomplish, and uh, we're actively working on those, and we're hoping in the summer to introduce a product that will change the suppressor industry like both of these products have. I got a quick question on decibel ratings real quick. Um, now, I've seen both. I've seen a decibel reduction, and I've also seen a true decibel rating. What's your opinion on one versus the other, are they pretty much the same? You know, it's, about? Yeah, it's just simple math. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's just reduction yeah. rating, but a lot of companies get wrapped up in not wanting to publish data mm -hmm. or just kind of making up data. Or there's, there's, it's kind of like lumens and flashlights. You know, right. candle power versus lumens. It's the same kind of a, of a debate. Um, it's not going to end anytime soon. Um, we have nothing to hide and. We are happy to let anybody sound test our stuff that wants to sound test it. We have competitors that have sound tested our stuff, and we sound test our competitors, and we're pretty open about it. And, you know, there's a lot of times where our suppressors will get beat by somebody else, you know, or, or we beat them. And, and on any given day, one may be quieter than the other. But we have nothing to hide, and we're all about testing and publishing that test data, and we do that all the time on the Internet via our website and we do YouTube videos and things like that where we'll compare same host weapon, same ammo, five different suppressors. You know, we'll do that pretty regularly. Um, we tend to post sound output levels. Mm -hmm. um, it saves you from doing the math. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's... A 45 unsuppressed is 165. 162, yeah. 165. You know, so you don't have to do the math the other way. Right. 
so we'll we tend to post actual output then mm -hmm. rather than reduction levels because um, those all change based on atmospheric conditions and ammunition yeah, they, and hosts you know, and DB or two here or there. So obviously it's going to be greater decibel rating in the cold and things like that, right? There's a lot of things that go into that. Um, yeah, yeah, temp, humidity, like you right. said, altitude. Yeah. I mean, it all, it all. It's it's much like why stuff shoots faster or slower out of a rifle. It, altitude, humidity, temperature. You know, yeah. they, they all come into play. Um, Barrel length on that and yeah. this as well. It, yeah, that, that kind of all ties into um, kind of the subsonic ammo we were talking about earlier. You want to kind of give a recap on, you know, why you'd want to shoot subsonic ammo. And People shoot subsonic ammo because it stays below the sound barrier and it's quieter. Um, you get you get sonic crack or ballistic crack anytime a bullet breaks the sound barrier, and out of a suppressed weapon, um, that crack is kind of an omnidirectional sound, and you'll hear it downrange more than you will at the at the gun. Mm -hmm. So you still do get that location masking advantage, but it is louder. I, I compare sonic crack a lot of times to uh, sounding much like an unsuppressed 22 long rifle. Um, so if you want optimum sound reduction, you will you'll have to use subsonic ammo because no one's yet figured out how to wait yeah. a way to make a bullet break the sound barrier and not crack. Um, <laughs> no one's been able to figure out how to do that, and I don't know that they ever will. Um, but the use of subsonic ammo—that's the next one, Mike. I'll figure that one out. Yeah, he's gonna work. <laughs> on Actually, that. we a friend of ours thinks that he can do that, but well, we'll see. Yeah. But uh, the the use of subsonic ammo will make the suppressor more effective in a sound suppression, um, in, the, in the area of sound suppression. Now, typically when you do that, you use a heavier bullet. So a lot of times, the offset that you lose by putting the bullet out at higher velocity is gained back, or at least gained back in some degree by the use of heavier bullets. Yeah. So, you know, you, where your 9mm 115 ball ammo is kind of the generic load if you will, the subsonic version is 147 grains, so significantly heavier projectiles at lower velocity to maintain some power level. Um, and that runs across the board, 40 caliber, 180 grain. Some days those are borderline supersonic, but a lot of times they stay subsonic. Um, and 45 ACP, generally anything 230 grain is going to be subsonic, um, where lighter things may not be, you know, the 155s. You know, some of the real life 45 ACP ammo can go supersonic. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, and I, I largely blame the video game industry for this, but there's a lot of misconceptions that the use of a sound suppressor will lessen the effectiveness of the host firearm and the cartridge that it fires. That is not the case. Um, maybe really early on in, in suppressor development when they used wipe suppressors, they would actually contact the bullet and would slow the projectile down. Um, and some designs, like an MP5 SD with an integral suppressor, where the barrels are bent ported, bent, vented the right. full length, right. those are designed to make supersonic cartridges exit at subsonic velocities. So you are looking at a reduction in power and effectiveness mm -hmm. from that perspective. But with these muzzle suppressors, like we make, typically you actually get a little <coughs> bit of a push, a slight gain, and it's almost inconsequential but it is a slight gain typically rather than a loss of velocity. Right. And so they really don't affect ballistically the ammunition that you shoot. So if you shoot supersonic ammo, it will still be supersonic when it comes out of this. If you shoot subsonic ammo, it will still be subsonic when it comes out of this. But it's really a function more of ammunition than it is about the right. suppressor. So there's not a uh, there's not a loss of power by shooting through a suppressor. It's more a function of the ammo that you choose on the front side. Gotcha. Well, guys, do you have anything else you want to add before Mike needs a rock star? I don't think so. <laughs> that seemed pretty good. All right. Well, guys, I really appreciate you having us out. And it was great to uh, see what you guys are doing here at Silencer Co. And well, thanks for everything. coming out. You're always welcome here. Absolutely. Hope we can uh, come back out and you guys get some rifle stuff going, too. Coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Thank you.